instead of giving into this temptation, we need to say the world is loved by God, and therefore we need to love the world as well. That's what St. Paul meant when he said, our struggle, our wrestling match, our adversaries, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, because they were being persecuted by flesh and blood. The Roman soldiers that arrested them and killed them and slew them were flesh and blood people like them. But St. Paul says, our quarrel is not with them. Our quarrel is not with Rome, our quarrel is not with the police, our quarrel is not with the emperor, our quarrel is not with people. Our wrestling match is with the principalities and powers, the demonic world forces that rule the world. What do you do with flesh and blood? You love them because Jesus died on the cross for them. So our, our heart is open in love to the world. You see, the world persecutes us. It doesn't matter whether they persecute us or not. We still need to love and embrace the world and to feed the hungry of the world. There still needs to be diakonia. There still needs to be selfless service. But the Lord God, uh, before his disciples knelt before them and washed their feet, that is our posture to the watching world. Whether the world persecutes us or not, we still need to wash the feet of the world, wash their wounds, and feed the hungry of the world. So that's the first thing. To be a, a disciple of Jesus Christ, to celebrate the Feast of the Elevation of the Cross, means that we expect persecution and unpopularity, but it does not let us drive us into a cult mentality. We still need to have our hearts open to love the world. The second thing that, if, that the Feast of the Elevation of the Cross calls us to is uh, separation against society and so that we define ourselves over against the society at large. It was otherwise in Byzantium. In the days of St. John Chrysostom, for example, um, in the days of John Chrysostom, whether he was in Antioch or whether he was in Constantinople, because he was a priest in Antioch before he was the bishop of Constantinople, uh, the whole city was Christian. You might have had the odd Aryan little um, uh, gathering place, you, had, you, you would have your synagogues, you would have the old pagan families who were kind of uh, clinging to power, rather like supporters of Gaddafi, I suppose, like that, you know, just kind of don't know, it's all over and you don't know it, but at any rate, so, but, but, but all, so you have these little centers, you would have the Aryans and the Jews and the pagans, but basically the whole city was Christian, and the whole city, it was a smaller city uh, in those days, could be used as sacred space, you could have a procession in which pretty much the whole city took part in the processions as they went from church to church. And so you could count on everybody in, church, everybody in the city being baptized and ending up in church. Uh, there was one time when they had a particular riot when they did some damage to the emperor's statues in Antioch, which was considered a capital offense. You, you get killed for that. The emperor takes a very dim view of him, uh, that, of that, that sort of thing. And so the slaughter went on. And you had lots of guys in church then. Everybody was in church. And so John Chrysostom did not fail to point out see a lot of you guys in church that I haven't seen for a long time. Nothing like disaster to kind of bring the church, bring the city to where it's supposed to be. So you had, in those days, you could count on the whole city being a Christian city. Now you can't. Now we define ourselves over against, uh, it was uh, Harvey Cox called the secular city. All the cities are secular by definition. So just like in the older days, our return to the catacombs means that we have to create communities create subcultures. There's the wider culture out there, and we create another community within the wider community of the city. We create a Christian community. It's not so much the community church, where all the community goes, but rather the almost the opposite of that. Not the community church, but the church community, that we need to strive to become one body. Now, at St. Herman's, of course, geography is the enemy. We're spread out from... White Rock and Vancouver to Chilliwack, and so it's a little hard, and, and we're not as good at it as we should do. Sometimes, you know, they, 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 people fall between the cracks a little bit uh, more than we would like them to. But this is the challenge, that now we belong to one another. In the early days, for example, they have someone called the doorkeepers, and they would be, they'd be watching the doors, and they would watch everybody that came in. What are they watching for? Well, first of all, they're watching to make sure that there are no... Uh, um, informers and policemen among them who would kind of arrest them for what, for what, they're, going to, they're, what they're going to be doing. And what, at, when, when it got to be really hot and really dangerous, they, the deacon would instruct the doorkeepers to say, okay, shut the doors, nobody comes in. The doors, the doors, that's what that's about. Close the doors and make sure nobody comes in. We're about to do the Eucharist and we're all dead men if they would be catching us doing this. So that, that's what that was about. The point is that the doorkeepers knew everyone that was there. 
We became one single body, one single uh, holy people united around the chalice of, of the Lord. They knew one another. And so this is our challenge as well, to become a community when people know one another and share one another's life. It's not just a matter of you come, you light a candle, you receive Holy Communion, you say, don't know anybody else here, but aren't they nice and, and you're gone. No, that's, that's, uh, that could maybe work in Byzantium, it could maybe work where there's large state churches, uh, but it doesn't work in the early church, and it doesn't work now, because the days of the early church have returned, and we are meant to be a community. We are meant to belong one to another. The Feast of the Elevation of the Cross calls us back to the catacombs and says you must now create a community. If St. Hermans reaches the stage where we, there's uh, 200 people in church, uh, we, we, this will never happen in this building, but if it starts to reach that stage, then we need to split because you can't sensibly know 200 people and have that sort of uh, uh, fellowship of life with 200 people. There's nothing for it, then we'd have to plant uh, another daughter church someplace else. It's a long ways down there, probably after I'm dead and gone, but we'll see. But the point is we need to have a small enough community so that people can know and love and care for one another. So that's the second thing. The third and last thing that the Feast of the Elevation of the Cross calls us to is, that, is to conversion. We need to tell the world that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is not dead, he is alive. Three days after he was slain on the cross by the evils of men, God raised him triumphantly from the dead and he lives and gives forgiveness and life and hope and transfiguration to anyone who will come to him in repentance and faith. That's the message. In the days of St. John Chrysostom, you can kind of assume, yeah, everybody knows that. The Jews don't buy it and the pagans are the last holdouts, but basically, yeah, everybody knows that. Now people do not know it. There's a tremendous ignorance of the basics of the Christian faith. Remember one time I was filling up uh, my car with gas, dressed a lot like this. I didn't have a fellow on, but I had my normal kind of thing, normal cassock and the cross. The person filling up the gas was a, a Sikh individual, and he says, oh, who's that? I, said, I was quite astonished at the question. I said, oh, uh, that's my God. His name's Jesus. Oh, okay. So yeah, you're filling the car with gas. You got to, okay, okay, don't do that. So you, you, would, you would think that he would know. If I see a little statue of the Buddha there, I don't say, who's the fat guy? No, no, I know that's, that's, that's the Buddha, the enlightened one, Gautama, you know, that sort of stuff. Yeah, I know who that is. So there's not a, I know that in Buddhism we talk about the noble eightfold way and all that stuff. Okay, fair enough. I know a little bit about Buddhism. But the ignorance of the Christian faith is almost total in our culture. The Christian faith is whether they have apostatized from enough that it's not that they are rejecting the Christian faith, it's that they have never been exposed to it. They don't know. What they are very often rejecting is, is something that I would reject too. You say, these Talmud, these Talmud evangelists, i got no time for them. Yeah, me too. I also have no time for them. What you are rejecting in the, in the secular society, what they think is the Christian faith, is something worthy of detestation and rejection, and it's not actually the Christian faith. We're not selling that either. So we need to let the people know what we are selling. What is our message? And our message is, as I say, Jesus Christ. So we need to have an, uh, an outreach to those around us. Now, if you come from an evangelical background, you've got to kind of forget everything you knew about the four spiritual laws. Have you heard of the four spiritual laws? You say, no, good. Then you don't want to find out about the four spiritual laws. <laughs> Leave it alone. Because the four spiritual laws approach largely consists of saying to someone, you're going to hell, of course, uh, you know, but, and so, but if you say, if you do this little kind of a dance, uh, it says, it says, have the four spiritual laws and say this prayer, God will not fry you. Aren't you happy? <laughs> That's the good news? God's going to send me to hell. Thank you very much. Don't give me the bad news then. So, so this is, you got to kind of forget this. It is not a matter of trying to control. It is, it is not a matter of judging someone. It is a matter of saying, as, as Philip said to his friend Nathaniel, we have found him who Moses and the law wrote about and the prophets, Jesus of Nazareth. And when Nathaniel said, you know, right, uh, can anything good come out of Nazareth? He didn't give him a long argument. He didn't pump him full of Bible verses. He just said, come and see. And this is the orthodox approach of offering Jesus to the world. We're not saying who's going to heaven or hell, that's for God to decide. He keeps the records and he doesn't share carbon copies with us because it's none of our business. He just says 
this is the life of the world. Jesus Christ loves you. He is alive. He is able to give life and transfiguration, hope and joy to any who will open themselves up to him fully and meaningfully. Do you want it or not? And if someone says, I'm not sure I can believe that, instead of arguing, just say, come and see. Liturgy's at 10 o'clock. We are just, we are not there to argue. We are there to share a reality which has touched our lives. And be real clear, Orthodox are not good at this. In fact, Orthodox are pretty, genuinely lousy at it. The Orthodox think that the, the message that we offer to the world is Orthodoxy. As a matter of fact, we have the message that the Orthodox do offer to the world is not Orthodoxy. It is Jesus Christ. Obviously, we offer the Jesus of the Orthodox Church in the fullness of Orthodoxy, as opposed to the Mormon Christ or the Jehovah's Witness Christ or the Christ of the, uh, forgive me, of the CBC or something like this or whatever, all of the other rival Christs that there are. We offer the, the Christ of the, of the ecumenical councils, of the scriptures, of the fathers, we offer the Christ of Orthodoxy. But the message is not Orthodoxy. The message is not lighting candles. The message is not icons. The message is not our beautiful Orthodox worship. Our message is Jesus Christ. He is the one who is the Son of God, a, a risen from the dead. He is the one in whom all our hope resides. So we go we're into the catacombs, and this is our message. We are back in the darkness of the catacombs, but the darkness is not dark. Those narrow catacombs are not narrow because Jesus is there with us. He who is the light of the world, he who is wider than all of the heavens, is there with us in that narrow space, transfiguring us. Feast of the Elevation of the Cross calls us back to the catacombs. Because whether the Byzantium will come and go, empires will rise and fall, but Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The message never changes. Jesus Christ, crucified, risen. Jesus, the hope of the world. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.